Well, thank you both um, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm here at the central branch of the Birmingham Public Library in Birmingham, Alabama, that is uh, the co-host of Men of Change, Power, Triumph, Truth, an exhibition developed by the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service and made possible through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company Fund. Uh, the Birmingham Public Library System has sought to bring information, support, and a sense of community to the city's residents for well over a century. The mission of the Birmingham Public Library is to provide the highest quality experience of lifelong learning, cultural enrichment, and enjoyment to our community. This program in particular is sponsored by Alabama Humanities Alliance, Founded in 1974, the nonprofit Alabama Humanities Alliance serves as a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Through their grants and public programming, Alabama Humanities Alliance connects Alabamians to impactful storytelling, lifelong learning, and civic engagement. I am Paul Barrett. I'll be moderating this uh, talk this evening. I'm very glad to have Stacy Morgan and Sean Leonardo here. Uh, I also, in particular, would like to thank Margaret Splain and Carrie Campbell at the Birmingham Public Library, without whom none of these projects would be possible. Uh, University of Alabama professor Stacy Morgan earned his BA at Wesleyan University and a PhD at Emory University. He teaches courses in African American art, pop popular culture in America, race and essentialism in American culture, American folk folklore, and art worlds and American values, among others. He is author of Frankie and Johnny, Race, Gender, and the Work of African-American Folklore in 1930s America, and Rethinking Social Realism, African-American Art and Literature, 1930 to 1953. Morgan previously worked with the library on the panel discussion for Spider Martin's Selma to Montgomery with civil rights foot soldiers, Diane Harris and Joyce O'Neill, and I'm very happy to have Stacy back. Sean Leonardo's multidisciplinary work negotiates societal expectations of manhood, namely definitions surrounding black and brown masculinities, along with the, its notions of achievement, collective identity, and experience of failure. His performance practice, anchored by his work in assembly, a diversion program for system impacted youth at the arts nonprofit recess where he is co-director is participatory and invested in a process of embodiment. Leonardo is a Brooklyn based artist from Queens, New York City. His work has been featured at the Guggenheim Museum, the High Line and the New Museum and profiled in the New York Times and CNN. Leonardo previously visited Birmingham to discuss his essay in my catalog for Thornton Dial I2 M Alabama at UAB, and also contributed artwork to the exhibition Men of Change. And Sean, I am very happy to be working with you again as well. So thank you both for being here. And uh, without any further delay, I will turn the conversation over to you two gentlemen. Okay, so thank you for the invitation to participate in this conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm very honored to do so. Uh, first, I would encourage anyone who might be watching online who has not yet had an opportunity to view the Men of Change exhibit firsthand. It is two venues at the Birmingham Public Library, the Central Branch, and the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute to do so before the show closes on December 2nd. Uh, in the Smithsonian's own wording, Men of Change, Power, Triumph, Truth profiles revolutionary men who have altered the history and culture of this country. And specifically, if you've seen it, you'll know that the exhibit pairs photographs and informational panels about African-American men, historical and contemporary, uh, with a series of 25 works of fine art created by Black artists. Uh, so in essence, each of these 25 artists um, created a kind of portrait 
uh, connected to a designated individual. However, as we'll discuss this evening, there are many ways to approach such a task of representation. Uh, to start with some basics, um, I, as a teacher and researcher whose focus includes work of African-American visual art and literature, one of my tasks this evening was to provide uh, some very brief words of art historical context through which to better understand the significance of what the Men of Change exhibit attempts and achieves. Um, we know that the history of portraiture has long been interwoven with issues of power and status, especially prior to the 20th century, to have one's portrait made and to control the nature of that representation in media like painting and sculpture typically was open only to select segments of society. So here are two examples. Uh, one of the Dutch artist Johannes uh, Versprong's portraits of a member of the Dutch Civic Guard named Andries Stilte, dressed to the nines and striking a regal pose in a way meant to spotlight his wealth and status. And we see one of Gilbert Stewart's famous portraits of George Washington completed near the end of Washington's presidency. That's a work that places less emphasis on Washington's wealth, more on his role as a statesman, but the emphasis on power and status in both paintings is very much front and center. Despite the widespread pres presence of slavery and other forms of disfranchisement, African Americans have pursued the goal of telling their own stories in media such as literature and visual art since before there was even a United States of America as such. Famously, Phyllis Wheatley arrived in the Massachusetts colony from Gambia, West Africa around age seven, mastered English to the degree of authoring a book of poetry by age 19, and essentially manumitted herself through literary work. But the reason we possess a visual image of Wheatley to accompany her poetry today is thanks to a man named Scipio Moorhead, a black artist whose formerly enslaved status paralleled Wheatley's own. And in this engraving based on Moorhead's painted portrait, he emphasizes Wheatley's literacy, intellectual com contemplation and dignity. Um, and we keep in mind that to display a woman of any race or social status in Britain or the American colonies in the act of writing was highly unusual at this time. And in fact, I believe Moorhead's portrait of Wheatley is the first known artistic image of a woman writer in the American colonies. And for her part, Wheatley wrote a poem in tribute to Moorhead titled 2SM, a young African American, an a, a young African painter, in which she praises his precocious talents and wishes him immortal fame. Fast forward to the mid 19th century, we find the recently self-emancipated Frederick Douglass among the earliest Americans to recognize the potential of the new technology of the daguerreotype, a precursor to the modern camera, to democratize portraiture by being affordable to a much wider swath of society. Even more, Douglass recognized the potential power of this new medium to make important statements about one's character and identity. Hence, he commissioned his first daguerreotype in 1841, just as he launched his public career as a crusader for the abolition of slavery. And he continued to have his portrait made throughout the remaining decades of his life into the 1890s, continually casting himself as a man of consequence and a man of change. Um, as a result, we now have more photographs of Douglas than we have of other such 19th century luminaries as Walt Whitman or even President Abraham Lincoln. This um, example from circa 1853 is one of only 160 distinct photos we still have of Douglas. Skip ahead through the Harlem Renaissance to the mid 20th century. We now, by then, of course, have a, a growing number of African Americans among the ranks of the, na the nation's formally trained artist. Uh, the exquisite draftsmanship of Charles White, certainly prominent among them. And like many of his contemporaries, White prioritized the creation of dignified images of African-American men and women and using his art to advance socioeconomic equality for Black folks collectively. And in this particular example, he portrays Frederick Douglass as a kind of guiding figure from the past in the rear of the of the illustration tearing down barbed wire that has um, imprisoned 
uh, a large group of, of wrongfully incarcerated African-American men, including a group known as the Trenton Six. And then White also places at the front of this procession the radical attorney William Patterson, um, another uh, contemporary important man of change in the mid 20th century. The Black Arts Movement of the 1960s and 70s took the mission of representing iconic African-American figures out of their art galleries and into the streets, onto the sides of buildings and other widely accessible public spaces. Following the lead of Afrocobra's more famous uh, Wall of Respect mural in Chicago from 1967, Hoskins, Parks, and Johnson painted their own Wall of Respect for the city of Atlanta on Auburn Avenue in 1974. Um, and again, recognizing the importance of blending historical and contemporary of figures, much as the Men of Change exhibit does in Birmingham right now, so that we get Douglas together with MLK, Malcolm, Du Bois, nods to African heritage alongside contemporary figure, then contemporary figures like Muhammad Ali um, and activist Angela, J and activist Angela Davis and jazz legend John Coltrane. Uh, so we zoom forward again into something closer to the contemporary era. African American artists have joined their peers in reimagining both who is an appropriate subject for portraiture and exploring new formal avenues of expression. Candy Wiley's landmark contribution to the genre has been to recruit otherwise anonymous young Black men uh, and later women. Uh, to pose for him. And as you may know, Wiley encouraged these subjects to choose a pose to their liking from among the trove of art catalogs in his studio. And in this way, Wiley created large scale paintings which, in which contemporary figures in their contemporary fashions mimic the pose of so-called old master paintings. Uh, in this case, it's the same Dutch portrait that you saw just a few minutes ago all of which Wiley overlays with decorative background of floral motifs and the like. And in this way, Wiley has dramatically expanded the range of black men who are represented on the walls of global art galleries and museums. Indeed, he's one of the handful of most, a handful of the most famous portraitists working in the art world today. But even before artists like Wiley and McLean Thomas and Amy Sherhold hit the scene, other African-American artists have begun to search for other forms of artistic expression that went beyond straightforward naturalistic portraiture. As just one case in point, consider David Hammonds' Chasing the Blue Train. This is a multimedia installation, consists of roughly half a dozen baby grand piano lids stood on their side, as well as a sizable pile of coal, some of it tinted blue, and around and through these objects run a set of model train tracks with the train itself painted a vibrant cobalt blue. And all of this was augmented by boom boxes paired with each of the piano lids simultaneously playing compositions by artists like John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, James Brown. And as the art critics reviewing the show have pointed out, there's an obvious nod to John Coltrane's Blue, Tra Blue Train album here, as well as his name, Coltrane. Uh, Hammond's loved and has always loved this kind of visual puns. Uh, but the installation also evokes broader currents in African American history. One might think, be prompted to think about the Underground Railroad, the train as a vehicle of the Great Migrations, industrial labor, coal as a route to economic uplift, music as a route to uplift, and music as a vehicle for creative expression and the validation of Blackness, and more. I think the possibilities opened up by this kind of non-figurative artwork kind of expand outward exponentially. Um, so with that, just by way of a kind of art historical background, I want to then uh, bring Sean into the conversation. Um, thinking about, could you talk a little bit, Sean, about why you think portraiture is important in the contemporary moment, maybe in light of some of this history, what specifically you think might be gained through an exhibition like this Men of Change? Certainly, Stacey, I really appreciate the question. Do you wish, yeah, maybe do you, 
So maybe we stop killing things in the room. Yeah. But I do very much appreciate and and ex want to express gratitude for the art historical survey, which I think gives us the overall container and context to look at the exhibition. You know, what really resonated for me in your offering here is the really the contested space in which Black American, certainly male portraiture, that contested space in which the portraiture will always operate. Acknowledging that visual storytelling has always had a very particular role in the consolidation of power and mm. expressing authority and expressing very limited a very limited view as to who and what we collectively should value and so the visual sight of representation particularly for quote unquote marginalized peoples has always worked upstream against what has been sta established as status quo. And I think for many of us, particularly in a contemporary sense, we must both acknowledge that friction in, in that we are working against a particular strain of representation, that which has introduced a white gaze for all image making, and yet try to create rupture within that space by introducing a different value set and potentially a different way of looking. And I think that's what this exhibition brings to light that there are, in its myriad of approaches, stylistically and otherwise, that there's a way to introduce some trickery, mm. introduce some agency, reclaim the agency into how one utilizes visual storytelling to depict an individual. But it it will always just to back up and refer to mm -hmm. refer to uh, you know what you've what you've offered us in in terms of the trajectory of representation. It will always, as W. E. B. Du Bois has has really uh, given us as a context, will always inevitably bring to light this notion of double consciousness, in which as black subjects. We have to be, whether acceptingly or not, be cognizant of how we are being seen outside of us and the perceptions that precede us, which might prefer to demean our subjecthood. We must be both conscious of that while attempting to create a new visual language around how we wish to be presented. Yeah. I think it's a way of segueing more specifically to your work. Um, I may share just for just another second here. Please do. Uh, for, just for the benefit of people who might be watching who haven't had a chance to see the artwork at the Civil Rights Institute. Yes. Yeah. Um, just to the range of work there is one uh, I would I would want to emphasize, right, that you have artists who are who are utilizing relatively straightforward, realistic figurative representation like Albert Conte's painting, uh, Home Team, uh, representing uh, filmmaker Ryan Coogler. You've also got work by uh, Derek Adams that's, you know, bringing in uh, kind of starting to bring in a more multimedia approach, bl blending painting and collage and even um, 3D elements with the tiny cars that are on the highways crisscrossing Kendrick Lamar's uh, image here. Someone like Shante Gates. Um, 
has this still image of Dick Gregory paired with a uh, video work that blends elements of a uh, footage of Gregory, but also animation, video game imagery. It's a really kind of um, engaging piece. And in Men of Change as well, we've also got someone like Rad Radcliffe Bailey, who's eschewing the representation of the human figure altogether, right, for a more conceptual piece in some ways. And so I think amidst that landscape, then there's your own piece, uh, champion for LeBron James. Um, could you tell the audience a little bit about, you know, your artistic path or journey that led you to this particular approach where, and where this fits in with your artistic practice and where it's going right now? And I'll stop sharing here so you can... Certainly. And thank you for that. And thank you for that very quick overview of some of the contributions. And what I would say as additional context to my own addition is that what I see in that in that spectrum mm -hmm. of, of representations between that those that are more uh, figurative, as you said it, and to those that are more hybrid in form and uh, as to and then leading to those that are more abstract are artists that very consciously and deliberately wrestled with not what it means to represent the portrait of an individual, but instead evoke an in individual, mm -hmm. which I think is incredibly important as the filter through which we look at the works in this exhibition. For so many of us, myself included, the call that this exhibition provided, the call, the invitation to really embody the importance of these individuals with a single work of art and the responsibility to do that I think for many of us really was a call, a cause to best capture the spirit of that individual and therefore the breadth of importance that that person carries for our communities, our country, and therefore herself in our own personhood. Which brings me to this anecdote, which I hope that doesn't doesn't get anyone in trouble. <laughs> but when I when I was first invited, and they shared with me the intention of pairing me with LeBron James, I have to tell you that the very first thing that came up for me is that I don't watch basketball. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, you know, a figure such as LeBron James, you would be, you would have to be hiding under a rock to not know who that is. And yet the pressure of really bringing myself to proximity to his importance within the sport at first made me refuse the project. Mm -hmm. They then called me in to further explain that it was both in my stylistic approach, but also in my own personal engagement with sports as a as a cultural um well in my case both in performance work and two-dimensional work the embodiment of both the cultural attitude the it's the ways in which it codifies masculinity and race that it was really the the breath in which I was engaging with my own experience of athletics and therefore the ways in which my experience with sports um, determined how I would both see the world, but also perceive myself, my own, mm -hmm. my own race and masculinity, that mm -hmm. it was through that lens in which they were looking at the possibility, the potential of me engaging a figure such as LeBron James, which therefore, Led, led me to accept. And yet, Stacy, there was the expectation 
that in engaging LeBron as a subject, that the portrait would still be of an individual activated within the sports realm, within basketball. And I totally get it. I totally understand that as a viewer, if you are contemplating audienceship, one would assume that at least on surface level, the artist would wish to exemplify his prowess within the sport. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that that was immediately the least interesting thing for me. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking for the depth of this person. I started looking for what we might consider in regards to his legacy. And yes, while he is often described as potentially the greatest of all time, I really started to ask myself, as is the nature of everything I do, what is the memory that will be left behind? Is it the slam dunk or is it something else? And in my exploration of LeBron, what really rose to the surface were his efforts in creating a school yeah. and utilizing his resources, his leverage, his visibility, his power in creating a space for young kids that look like him to have a very different path than he did. And I started to say to myself, is this the thing that will be remembered? Mm -hmm. Of course, in the complexity of one human being. And so in this particular piece, what I started to research and look out for were the ways in which he would affect, the ways in which he would attempt to communicate off the field. And I located one particular speech at the opening of his school in Cleveland, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a very particular thing with his hands in emanating the importance of this moment, not only to the community, but to himself. And I extracted that particular gesture. Now, if you know my work, I often do hone in on you know, a type of information, or I might say a truth that slips out through our body that can never possibly be conveyed through verbal language. The ways in which there is a very different type of story quite often that is expressed through body language and there was something about those hands that particular gesture that for me was the thing that most related how we might understand this individual's importance to humanity and certainly to his immediate community and i wanted to and I should say this was the first of this kind of work for me, I really wanted to focus in on that gesture to question how any particular gesture might provide a, a visual narrative or story of an individual. And to the latter part of your question, that led me down, surprisingly, led me down an interesting path in which from that moment I expanded this gesture making, or I should say this sort of consolidation of an individual into a single gesture, into an entire body of work. And if you wish, I can share some of that work now. What do you feel? Yeah, please. I'm, I'm sure people would love to see that. 
That so works. for those of you in the invisible audience, what I'm going to share with you is, again, a, a series of paintings. I call them paintings. Um, similar to LeBron James, those are larger than life. So each hand is about four feet by four feet or larger. So if you can imagine together, that land takes up quite a bit of real estate. That's both hands takes up um, quite a bit of real estate on the exhibition walls. And so the paintings that I'm about to show you are on plywood cutouts, similar to LeBron's hands, and uh, are, are utilize a rather slick, old school sign painter's paint, which gives it that very, um, very clean finish and semi gloss finish. And what you can't experience in in the reproduction of the works on this screen is that there's actually a metallic finish within the paint so with the right lighting condition conditions those hands actually kind of glow uh, with a sort of a pearlescent pigment embedded in the paint but before i show this to show the these paintings it, it just occurred to me i didn't complete <laughs> i didn't complete the uh the anecdote um, when I first proposed my approach to the exhibition team, there were concerns expressed, as you can imagine. Again, with the expectation that um, the representation, the representation of LeBron James might be more easily identified, identifiable, and therefore codified within some sort of sports uh, paraphernalia. And I really advocated for this approach, but there were quite a bit of doubts, near refusal, near, near rejection, though we all decided to sit on it. And it must have been one or two weeks later, <laughs> um, it was returned to me that in some space, during some meeting, uh, my proposal was actually shared with LeBron James team and they actually preferred my suggestion on proposal that something that might be qualified by by basketball so that was a moment of really great validation <laughs> no that's that says a lot that says a lot i think it says a lot and yeah. I'm unsure if that came from his own mouth or, you know, if, it's mm -hmm. if something was translated, how it might have worked. But yeah. I do think those individuals that are in the seat of power, that are in um, so certainly, certainly someone like LeBron James, who has been um, dubbed the king, I would bet that he sees himself in in all of his on all the complexity of humanity and what he has to offer the world for sure as it doesn't surprise me that he might he might understand what my um what my wishes were mm -hmm. and so with that being said let me share with you all this uh, a portion of a body of work that actually was just presented at, uh, very recently, in the last few days, with Kristen Tierney Gallery at the ADAA Art Show Fair. Just came down just a day or two ago. And again, these are paintings on plywood cutouts. So what you're seeing are these hands mounted directly onto the wall. And I'm starting with this particular image, just to show you uh, the scale of what these works might be in, in in physical presence. And these are the hands of James Baldwin. It's a close-up view. This body of work is, in, is entitled The Messengers. And LeBron, the LeBron James um, piece was executed some years ago but then brought me into, of course, uh, the experience of the pandemic. And I really started to contemplate for myself and in reflection under the context of the pandemic and experience of 
so much tragedy during that time, I started to contemplate who for me were those contemporary prophets that in moments of shared wisdom really shaped how I see both the world and myself. Surprisingly, while I have read quite a bit of James Baldwin, just to offer you one case study, what I gravitated toward in regards to his wisdom were words that he shared in an interview outside of his field, outside of his literary prowess. And that tracked for many of the individuals that came to me, what I could recall as the thing that really rocked my world, quite often were these moments of spoken brilliance outside of the individual's chosen field. And then similarly to my approach with researching LeBron James, what I tried to find were either the very exact gesture, that iconic thing that that individual would do with their hands repeatedly, or I would find the gesture that that individual did during that specific moment of speaking. And so again, this is being that iconic uh, pose that James Baldwin would take. I'm sort of mimicking it in the in, in the camera for you all. This is David Driscoll, a mentor of mine, also a pioneer in African-American art history, arguably the person who had most influence in that field and also a brilliant painter. We were very close. And this is something that I sourced as remembering he often doing with his hands when we were together. And so I should share that the, the individuals span those that might be very much known, um, both within their fields, but across popular culture, let's say. And then I think also the individuals that are maybe much more intimate relationships or those that are maybe lesser known. Tony Morrison, also giving you a bit of a close-up look to, to really show you the camouflage aesthetic, the almost topographical aesthetic that breaks up as you approach the piece and then it gains cohesion as you move away. Bruce Lee. And so you can see that some of them are um, maybe more esoteric and while others are more comfortably within popular culture. But, you know, I offer Bruce Lee as a perfect example of, of, you know, these hands that were extracted not from an action pose or something that might be considered more of an iconic Bruce Lee gesture. Instead, what I could remember very specifically was a lesser known interview in which while the interviewer was more fascinated with his celebrity status, Bruce Lee was attempting to find these moments in which he could express his dignity in the ways in which he was a full human being and that being the thing that he would do with his hands as he was calculating these moments where he might interject and change the narrative. This is Brian Tripp, an elder that I had the honor of meeting during my grad school years. Lourdes Grobe, famous for her photography in Mexican wrestling. Another close-up view. These are the hands of Eric Garner, who was tragically killed by the NYPD now almost 10 years ago, I believe. Just saying that out loud is, feels so bizarre. 
but importantly, this being the gesture he did with his hands, not when the life was being squeezed out of him, but instead in an often overlooked moment in which he really was begging, almost pleading with the officers and really voicing his frustration in having to cope with continuous interactions with the police. Not solely that, not solely in that moment, but offering us a much uh, wider understanding of what his experiences were of being surveilled and persecuted. Nina Simone, Tupac Shakur, Walter Mercado, the famous Latin American astrologer that streamed from my grandmother's TVs, whether I pay pay every Saturday, whether I paid attention to it or not. <laughs> and then my one of my best friends growing up. One of the individuals for which, of course, there could be no video footage found, but who was so crystallized in my mind, this gesture being so crystallized in my mind as, as the thing that most embodies his presence and all of the wisdom that he offered me when we growing up. And then finally, Aretha Franklin, whose wisdom, whose... really just incredible presence was not found necessarily in particular words, but just how she would hold the stage. And that incredible hyper presence and way of connecting mind, body, and spirit really being the kind of thing that showed me what I wanted to be in the world. Stop sharing for a moment. Thank you for offering me that space, Stacy, to tell you what the trajectory and post um, production has been since the LeBron James piece. Yeah. Thanks so much. Beautiful work, beautiful Thank work. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it just impossible. Those are great images. It's impossible to really fully convey on an online screen just how powerful this work is when you see it in person, certainly. Um, and then, Paul, I don't know what our time frame is. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I would be happy to ask the uh audience who is here as well as uh, opening it up to anyone who is joining us online uh, who would like to type a question into the chat and I'm going to look into the audience here to ask if there are any folks who would like to uh, ask anything that I can relate to the two of you. Beautiful. Thank you, Paul. Keep an eye on the chat as well. I will give it another moment, but if I don't see anything, I'm going to take that as your talk has been so illuminating that everyone is still absorbing the wisdom that you've shared with us and uh, hopefully planning to go back and visit or revisit the exhibition at the Birmingham Public Library and Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. You know, Paul, I wouldn't mind some, somewhat returning a question to you, Stacy. Sure. We started with 
in light of uh, art historical foundation to how we might approach representation in a contemporary art world. I'm wondering how for you the power and possibilities of portraiture has shifted in the last few years. And I'm thinking, you know, and we talked offline a little bit about the respectability politics that came with the civil rights movement and the ways in which portraiture and certainly self-portraiture played a very particular role of introducing images of dignity during a time in which uh, those were not on offer. And so it had a very particular political role in inserting itself within um, visuality or a visual language of Black Americans. And I'm wondering, how do you now see that power and, pos and those possibilities within maybe the last few years? Has it shifted at all for you, for you since Akahinde Wiley and the ways in which that has operated within the art world? Um, I, I, th I think what just strikes me as being most significant is just the, the increasing range of individuals being represented so that when I think about the Men of Change exhibit, for example, um, I think to a credit of the Smithsonian, one thing that's really important about that exhibit is just the range of avenues to be an agent of social change so that it can be being the political activist like a Bayard Rustin. It can be entering directly into politics like Andrew Young, but it can also be in community, community service through education or through healthcare. Um, it can be by being a creative artist, right? By telling black stories real and imagined. That's all. So the breadth, of, the breadth of stories is really significant, and certainly Wiley's one artist who's done that. Um, also, really significant, I think, is this broadening of rep modes of representation. That I mentioned, David Hammonds. I see your work being very much in that vein. Well, because I think. One way to, for me, to evaluate art is, is, is it really, in some way, fundamentally transform the way I see the world. Mm. Um, and I, I can say, you know, that there are certain, like the Alfred Conte portrait of Brian Kugler, I'll take that away. It's just a really striking visual image that's kind of burned in my mind at this point. I think they'll carry that with me for a while. But then also looking at something like your piece, I think, in, the, in some way affects me on an even deeper level because it's going to affect how I go out and, and see the world around me differently because it, because you're capturing that iconic moment of a gesture and it's going to make me so much more cognizant of looking at people's body language and their gestures with hands but um, that's going to imprint the way that I go out and, and and see the actual real life world around me in a really profound way. And so I think that's like a really powerful gift that visual art can can give us. Yeah, thank you for that, Stacy. I've all, I've been thinking quite a bit um, about certainly in my own experience, but more broadly in the art world, the challenges to an expanded vocabulary of representation. Yeah. And certainly with Black Lives Matter as both a movement, but also philosophy, I have experienced and witnessed the call very similar in, or I should say in the vein of respectability politics. Mm -hmm for there to be a visual language that is immediately understood yeah. and also qualified as a dignified representation of blackness yeah. and certainly 
of the humanity of the individuals that who have been tragically killed by the police. And while I, while we could spend lots of time digging into the complexity of those requests, what I will offer you in relation to many, I think some of the questions that are coming, coming up is, well, I'll, I'll pose it as a question. And it really stems all the way back to the ways in which portraiture has played a very particular role in storytelling and in, again, in the consolidation of power, authorship, authority. Is it the artist's role? And this is not a question to you. I think it's a question for all of us to stay with. Is it the artist's role to create images that are the preferred representation of a person in a particular moment under a particular context. I would challenge that. Yep. I think we're always in. Re I'm sorry. Go, please go ahead. And, and maybe we'll return to this, but in in relation to certainly the complexity and friction in which portraiture has operated in the last few years in a political sense you know i often think about and relay something that a very good friend of mine artist steve Locke, shared in which he was really questioning the role of the quote-unquote dignified image of these tragically killed black and brown people human beings as they as the as the image that circulated in the media questioning whether that limited our ability to tell the truth mm -hmm. and he said something i will never forget that there's often the preference the desire for a dignified image for an individual that did not die a dignified death. And so how do we as artists prioritize telling the truth over everything else? And I think that has a role in how we see these works. That plays a role in how we see, how we should encounter the portraits portraits within this project. To some of the questions, and maybe I'll work. Well, I'll just work in order. Richard um, David is someone I met uh, at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. I was a resident there, excuse me, I was a participant there in 2004, and he was a visiting faculty member. And very quickly became a mentor of mine and just expressed so much care for not only my practice, but for my, uh, my growth as a human being. Yeah. And we spent quite a bit of time together. And strangely, he, he was just one of these older gentleman that really kept tabs on me and in and, and, and surprising ways would check in on me, invite me to things and would always give, give me that and offer me that quiet assurance that instilled with me a confidence to keep pursuing my practice. And it was being in presence with him very much when he would do this with his hands mm -hmm. that you know, my my experience was that he would never say anything explicitly or directly in regards to how I should think or how I should um, maybe navigate particular questions. It was it was just being around him and his storytelling that really shaped my worldview. You know, um, and in regards to how the work has been received, I, you know, I I I, I couldn't tell you. Um, all right, Claire, I'm, I'm not sure that, well, I'm sure someone in some type of audience capture could 
maybe begin to describe how my intent was received. But I would challenge you in your second question in regards to if people, quote unquote, got the LeBron James portrait as compared to the exhibiting teams I'm presumed to tend. I would say that should not be our concern. And I know that might be met with some pushback or tension. I think it is our objective, and by our, I mean both the exhibiting exhibitors and artists to not proceed with the pressure or belief that the works should be understood and instead to introduce a visual language, a representation as opposed to a representation of an individual that challenges their scene, challenges how, as you said, Stacey, how we might think of that person moving forward. And whether that escapes certain audience members, that's certainly true and possible and always very much the risk. But I think we're cheating our audiences also if we don't intend to not only follow the spirit of our own practice, but also push some of our limits and boundaries of what it means to engage portraiture. I think we're definitely much richer if we adopt a both and mentality that it doesn't have to be the straightforward image of dignity or abstraction, right? That, um, and, and that it's precisely sometimes the works that are the most challenging. That's where the growth is, I think, for that's viewers, right. right? That's the images that challenge us. That's, that's where we really... It may take a while. We may be thrown back on our heels momentarily, but that's okay if we can deal with that discomfort. I agree with you. And, and wade into it. Sometimes that reverberation, that resonance occurs much later down yeah. the line in the ways in which, again, a person is evoked for us and in our memory and um, how we then see this person the next time that they cross our view. And again, I think part of my hope in doing some justice toward our memory of someone like LeBron James is to question how we might remember a person of such significance. But certainly for me, I won't remember what he did on the on the court. Yeah. And I can say that very honestly mm -hmm. and blatantly. But what will stay with me forever is his intentionality, his gift, his generosity, to other young people. And Richard, I feel you, I see you. I very much miss him every day. Yeah, he was a giant in the field. Well, Sean and Stacy, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it uh for anyone here in the audience live they, they've probably noticed me staring rapt at the screen <laughs> the entire time uh, i appreciate both of you being here and i uh, look forward to watching this again so that i can take some notes when i'm not uh, watching you live uh and uh Thanks again to the Birmingham Public Library and Alabama Humanities Alliance for making tonight possible uh, and for all of the folks who uh, could be with us live tonight and those who uh, hopefully will watch this in the future when the, the recording is posted online. So uh, my extreme gratitude to uh, all of you and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you.